Hi, and welcome to Dick McAvoy's overview of video painting lesson number one. My name is Marcel Blanchet, and I want to welcome you all. I'm happy to introduce my friend Dick McAvoy, who is an oil and pastel painter and teacher extraordinaire. Thank you, Marcel, and thank you all. I appreciate you every one of you for coming to my first um, webinar, my first video painting lesson. Um, uh, I'm working with these guys from Mosaic. They've done a terrific job on the technology part of it. I don't know anything about technology. So if you have a chat, you can say something in the chat and Marcel will try to get, uh, handle that. But I'm also going to give you my contact information at the end, my email, so that if you have any questions whatsoever, please email me and I will get back to you. I'll, I'll, it might take me a day or two, but I'll get back to every single one of you. But again, thank you so much for coming. Um, as Marcel says, um, I, I have an oil and pastel painting background, but let me tell you a bit about how I got into my art. Um, I'm one of nine kids, and growing up, uh, my parents would basically say, get out of the house and play. So we all played sports. But one of the ways that I got a chance to have some time to myself was by sketching and drawing. And I even did a few pastel paintings as early as second grade when my parents gave me a little um, John Nagy 24-piece pastel set, and I did a couple of, of paintings there. Um, but I, I didn't take any courses through school, um, and I didn't take my first real art course until I got to college. I went to Brown University, a good school where I could play soccer, which I enjoyed doing. But one of the huge benefits of Brown was Rhode Island School of Design is right next door. And if you are at one school or the other, you can take courses at the other school and it's part of your college um, curriculum. So I took courses at RISD and, and loved it. And I realized something that I had done as a hobby that I really, really would love to do this. Although again, being one of nine kids and not having a great deal of money, I didn't want to, I didn't like the whole idea of being the poor artist, but I had a, a hobby that I absolutely loved. A few years later, after graduation, I went to um, Wharton Business School and I rearranged my entire second year of the MBA program there so that I could take a course at um, studying with Violet de Maisie at the Barnes Museum. Now, the Barnes uh, was you could hardly ever get in there. Um, but if you were a student, one of 30 people, you could come in on Tuesdays, the class is one to three. And you could come there as early as 10 o'clock. So that's why I had to rearrange my entire second year. I went every Tuesday at 10 o'clock with my little uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I would pick a different room. They had 23 different rooms in this mansion with, I want to say, 160 Renoirs and 35 or 40 Cezanne, uh, a dozen Medigliani's, Impressionists and post phenomenal collection. So I would take a different room every week from 10 to one and just study the paintings in that room. And then I would take the course from one to three. Um, I painted four, five, six paintings a year going forward, but I was trying to get my career going. And it wasn't until the early 1980s when I met and studied with my mentor, Herman Margulies, a phenomenal Polish impressionist. He was in the concentration camps. I think he was in Auschwitz and Buchenwald. Uh, but he survived partially because of his art, and he came out with a zest for life, and that zest he gave me. Um, and the finest, most wonderful vacations I had were three years running. I would go and live with Herman for one week a year, and I would live in the loft above the studio. And each day we would go out and hike, and we would take pictures, and he would say to me, so why are you taking that picture? What is it about that scene that moves you emotionally and such. So he was starting to teach me how to look with an artist's eye and see what I was, what was really pleasing me. We'd go back to the studio. I'd pick out something to paint. He'd leave for a couple hours. I'd start the painting around noon. He'd come back and give me a critique. Um, usually tell me <laughs> what I was doing right and wrong more than right. And then he'd leave again for a few hours and I'd finish the painting. I finished the whole task there was to, um, paint a 18 by 24 painting each day. And it was one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but he'd be back for dinner. He'd give me my final critique. Then we'd go out to a pub and uh, we'd drink until midnight and I'd do the same thing the next day. So these weeks were phenomenal. After the third year, 
Carmen said to me, listen, you, you, you've got some talent, but you're, you're only doing five or six paintings in the rest of the year when you do five paintings with me, and you're not going to get better fast enough and, and well enough. So he said, I want you to commit. And that's one of the things I'm going to say to you today, too, is if you have any interest in art, commit to yourself that you're going to do something with it. Um, prove to yourself, and I truly can help you prove that you have an artist within you, if you wish. Um, but he said, don't come back as a student. Come back as a friend, but just paint. And that was the best advice I ever had. Now, even though at that time I was traveling rather ridiculously, I was flying over 100,000 miles a year for my job. But I still, I said to my wife, I'm going to paint 25 paintings a year. And I made a commitment. And for the next 10 years, I did 25 paintings a year. I just made myself do it. And then after, in the mid 90s, I started changing. I said, I'm gonna make it 40 paintings a year. So over the last 35 years or so, I've painted, let's say 1200 plus paintings. And his advice was, you're gonna get a little bit better every 50 paintings. Now that sound, it, it may sound a little bit daunting, but when you're starting, you get a lot better very quickly because you're starting from a, a, you know, a lower base. What he meant was, and what I learned was, you will start to build your own style, your own, your own look, your own palette. And that's what I hope to teach my students in the video painting lessons. Uh, later on in this thing, I'm gonna show you some of the students' work and you'll see how they, they've progressed. But as, as uh, Marcel has introduced me, he said that I had come from my two favorite movements, Impressionism and Abstract Expressionism. This first painting um, is my impressionist look. Now, how did I get there? Again, I didn't, I didn't start painting until after college. I was first introduced to the impressionist though in, um, I think it was my junior year in high school when Mrs. Primer, my French teacher, assigned us a 20 page term paper on our favorite French impressionist. 20 pages in French, holy mackerel. Um, and what's, what's a French Impressionist? I knew a little bit about them, but I didn't know much. So she packed about 18 of us into a school bus and we went to the Boston Fine Arts Museum. And I fell in love. I mean, it was uh, Degas, it was Monet, Cezanne. I don't remember actually who I wrote about, um, but I fell in love with the Impressionist. And, and I just loved painting, capturing that moment in time with lots of different color, basically. Um, I painted that way, and Herman was a major Impressionist. He's in the Hall of Fame, the Pastel Society of America. Um, so I had his influence as well. This painting uh, in Etretat, I was exhibiting, I've had the good fortune to exhibit in a number of different countries, but I was exhibiting in France, and after the exhibit, there were maybe 10 of us as artists, uh, three Poles, uh, a Portuguese uh, artist, a Spaniard, a couple of Frenchmen, Oh, someone from Taiwan and another lady from Haiti. We went out to paint in Etretat where Monet and others have painted. And I captured this in a smaller nine by 12 um, pastel and then did this painting back in my studio. And this was an 18 by 24, a little bit bigger. But so this shows my impressionist style. When I get into the nineties and I was visiting museums and such, I was realizing though, besides my love for Impressionism, I was being drawn more and more to the abstract Expressionists. And this is my first, one of my very first paintings there. The abstract Expressionists were like Jackson Pollock, um, uh, Joan Mitchell, one of my favorite, Robert Motherwell. I love their expressiveness. Now, they didn't show landscape. They, their things were totally abstract. And I, my first attempt at it, was still showing a bit of a landscape. This came out of my head from thoughts of poppy fields, either in Tuscany or in, in Provence. And this is a 36 by 36. It's a fairly large painting. It's all palette knife, and I'm just putting down pigment on the, on the surface. But it's where I can see that my style was starting to go from not just Impressionism, to but to something else that a little bit more abstract. And then on this next slide, I show uh, I remember being, I think it was 2004, 2005, I was visiting the Modern Art Museum in New York, MoMA, with my dear friend, Frank Federico, a, another phenomenal painter. And um, 
I was struck by the materials that these guys were using. Um, I, I said, Frank, look at this. Robert Motherwell, oil and enamel. Jackson Pollock, oil and enamel. Um, Mark Rothko, oil and enamel. Joan Mitchell, oil. And, and he goes, so what? I said, enamel is house paint. And still he, he shrugs and he goes, okay. And I said, Frank, I can throw house paint. I can drip it. I can drop it. I can... I believe my, my whole style is I don't worry about mistakes. But with house paint, I'm really loose. I mean, I, if you look at my studio, I even have stuff on the ceiling because I'm tossing it and I hit the, uh, the eight or nine foot ceiling in my studio. Um, but this is one of my first, what I call abstract impressionist paintings where I'm dripping like um, Jackson Pollock. And I'm using the same sticks. You know, I went out the, right after the day with Frank at the MoMA. I went out and bought 40 quarts of oil paint. I went to Benjamin Moore, and they thought I was out of my mind. They, what are you possibly painting? I said, I'm an artist, and I'm, I'm having fun. But the same sticks that you use to mix the paint, I was using that same stick now, now that it's mixed, and now using it to drip and to throw and to plop stuff down, and even to move it around. Um, with the stick. So it allowed me to start using every kind of utensil possible. When I was painting in my studio just yesterday, I was using the pizza pie cutter, you know, the round thing. And I was making these crazy lines that go through because I was making some grasses in a dune grass area. Abstract impressionism, what it, it starts off as an abstract and you can blow this up as much as you want. Um, and it just, you can get your fingers tangled in the grasses. Um, but what I do is at the end, I still go in and punch in a few, a few flowers with my palette knife and with oil paint. And I come up with what I think of as a, a landscape. So there's a little bit about my background. Let me start to walk you through kind of some of the things that you will learn in the video painting lesson with me, if you, if you choose to. Um, I'm going to have six or seven different tips for you right here, though. First one is everyone that paints with me asks, OK, what materials do I need? And what I'll usually do is look at what they have and I'll say, that'll do. Um, but I will recommend my favorite pastels, my favorite oils, my favorite colors, my favorite brands uh, and the different surfaces. However, I do want to remind you, tip number one is there is no one right color and there is no one right brand. Um, I harken back to uh, Toulouse the track, another more post-impressionist, but a wonderful painter from the early 1900s. The track would be in a in a bar up in Montmartre in Paris, and someone would come and offer him money to go paint those women over in the corner, and he would take whatever he had at his disposal. He would take some oil paint, and if he didn't have enough, he would um, loosen it up with turpentine, and then he would take a surface. Oftentimes, it was cardboard, corrugated box. Next time you go to a museum and you see a tools to truck painting, take a look at the materials because more often than not, you're going to see that his paintings that are now 120 years old or so were done on corrugated box or cardboard. So yes, there's some wonderful materials. Yes, I will recommend them for you, but you can make do with them, almost anything. Okay, next thing to do is Whenever I paint, I feel it daunting to me to start with a white surface. I can't stand the white surface. I want something underneath that surface that's going to come through my painting to enrich my painting. So if I want some darks to come through like that anemone frenzy painting that I just showed you, I'll start with a base like this. Now this is, it doesn't look like much, but this excites me when I, when I set up my canvas. These are three colors. This is viridian green, uh, alizarin crimson, and some kind of either cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, some dark blue. But that mixture gives you this gorgeous, warm, bluish purple um, underpainting that I allow that to come through when I have some of my darks. So tip number two is always prep your surface. You'll, you'll, you'll just like it better. If you're going to paint Giverny with, with me down the road and there's an awful lot of green, that can feel quite daunting as well. We might prep our surface with a red because red is a complement to, to green. So I will help you with what to prep with and how to prep it, but you should always prep your surface with a color of some sort. All right, let's go to the next slide that we have in our presentation. Seeing with an artist's mindset and an eye. So this tip number three is 
you will learn to do this. One of the big things that Herman taught me way back when in the early 80s was he, he would ask me, why is it that you're looking at this? What makes you want to pick, paint this? And tell me what it is. So he would draw that emotion out of me. And if you, I, I swear, if you can t get yourself to understand the emotion, you will paint better. Your painting will be better. The emotion for me here, another tip, will be this, this happens to be a scene from um, across the street from where my grandmother had a tiny little cottage just off the Cape, Cape Cod. Now, my, I'm one of nine without a lot of money. My, my mom was one of 11 with even less money. And so the cottage that they had was truly a tiny little cottage. It's still there. It's a nicer, beautiful building now that someone else owns. But um, it, there was a dirt road and then this marsh. And I can remember even as a six, seven, eight-year-old walking across that same little footbridge, trying to catch minnows in that little canal, there, walking in the mud. It, so this... This elicited a lot of wonderful, warm, emotional memories, which comes through. If you have that when you're looking at what you want to paint, you're going to paint a better painting. So that's another tip is to find an emotional response. The next thing is taking and editing your own reference photos. If you choose to ever submit to a show, I've submitted to shows in different countries. I've, I've exhibited in, in France, in Taiwan, in Italy all over the Northeast, if you choose to, you have to take your own photos. Because if someone else is taking a photo for you and setting it up for you and setting up the lighting and, and choosing what's right and what's wrong and, and making the scene beautiful for you, now all you're doing is adding pigment. Still a big task, but they're doing part of the task for you. So learn to edit and take your own reference photos. Okay, now we'll go to the next slide if we may. Um, no, we, there we go. Sorry, guys. We're still working on our technology here. Um, sketching in an outline and understanding the planes of our painting. I paint with the planes in mind where I'm thinking, okay, I want to paint what's behind the cloud or behind the trees or behind the marsh. So I look at a painting when I've chosen something. I start to paint in planes. I'll go back and forth across the planes, but I'll make sure that there are six different levels because I want to direct your eye to what I want you to see. In this painting, again, I, I explained the emotional appeal of the footbridge, and this is what we'll do in our first video painting lesson. I chose it and I, I cropped the photo to have just a tiny little sky at the top. That plane number one is the plane that is furthest away, and it's probably going to be five or eight percent of our painting surface when we finish the painting. But what I love about that is I'm going to show the bottom third of the painting is going to be reflections. The painting in plane number one, far back there, is a nondescript sky. But the reflections in plane number six, the one closest to me, are going to have all kinds of wonderful colors and reflections. All right, so paint, coming back to front, the next plane of this, this is the line of trees. Now, because our cameras are so good, there's a lot of detail in my photo. But in my painting, I'm going to show a little less detail. I'm going to show the shapes, some of the same colors. But I'm going to show a little less detail, again, to push the trees back in the painting and let everything else come forward. Plane number three is this little road. I think it's someone's driveway, actually. But what I like about it is that it's a backlit area, and it breaks up my tree line. Even if this little road path, whatever, wasn't there, I would... I might possibly put it in because it would be helpful to me in the painting. It adds a, a different level of interest back there, and it, it just makes my painting that much more, uh, I think, emotionally appealing. So now plane number four is between the footbridge, one of my highlights, and the tree line. I, I took this picture, I think, in late July or early August, but I allowed, when I do the painting, I allow for it to be even a little bit later, maybe, because I want... not. I don't want to show just lots of green grass, green uh, marsh. So with the later fall season, I allow myself with a lot more of the oranges and the yellows and the, the browns even of the, the grasses. And I allow in that fourth plane, I have the grasses lying flat as if the water has come in and sat on them for a bit. And I don't show any um, or hardly any 
grass is growing up and down because again, that would be too much detail for where I want in the painting. As I get to my footbridge, now the footbridge itself is gonna be the lightest light. That wood has been bleached because the sun's been on it for years and years. I don't think it's the same wood from 60 years ago, but um, it, this wood nevertheless has been bleached by that hot sun every day. So that'll be my lightest light. And then as I get closer, I'm going to show more and more detail. And when I get to the water, this is fun because only 5% of the painting is the background, that far distant plane number one, nondescript sky. But look at all the colors I can put into this. And I can use my imagination and accentuate those colors and put even more pinks and lavenders and, and beautiful colors into the water and the surface is the reflection and then put the, the grasses in. So I think that's tip, tip number six, but sketching in an outline and understanding painting from back to front. Now this is an, another painting. And it's also the idea of painting from underneath to up higher. If I, this is a place in Poverty Hollow where I paint fairly often. If I was even closer to the water, I might even be able to see the mud. And if that were the case, I would paint the mud first. Here I can't see the mud, but let me show you. I'm, I'm gonna talk about the depth three or four different planes in a less than a half an inch of total um, level. I'll start with the, um, the water itself, the water surface. The dark area, which is some of those same darks that I pre-painted and prepped the board, I allow those darks to come through, that shows the depth of the water. Okay, now I'm still painting the water surface. The second thing I show is reflections of the trees behind that are they're sitting on top of that same water so the same level water is showing both depth and reflected light from another um, from another source now on top of that water surface is my water lily which is what a couple of millimeters thick and i you'll see that i don't show any details of the lilies i don't paint an actual lily but i where the where the sun is hitting them i have them in light greens and yellows and lots of beautiful warm colors and where the sun is in or the sun is being blocked so i have more shadows those same lilies are blues and purples and lavenders um, but so there's three different levels and now one more level if i look at the lily and i see some grasses popping through i have now gone from what is essentially a couple of millimeters of depth and i show the depth of the water the water surface with the reflections the water surface with the, the um, water lilies on top of it and the grass is growing through it. There's four different levels of surface painting from bottom to, to top in a, in a tiny little um, half inch space or so. So understanding to paint from back to front and from underneath to top. Okay, um, let's go next. Now, uh, when I, I paint plein air fairly often and when I paint plein air, it's almost always with my pastel set my oils take longer to, to dry so for me it's just easier that i do uh, sometimes paint with oil outside but if i paint on plein air or if i paint a la prima which is finishing a painting at one sitting um, i will oftentimes allow myself the next day to go back for 10 minutes you do not want to overwork a painting but when you look at it with fresh eyes the next day you say okay just add a little highlight or something so you give yourself a tiny bit of time a while later and add a bit more detail. So on this uh, um, footbridge painting that we're gonna do in the video painting lesson, after the session, I went back a few hours later and just took a couple of light yellows and ochres and just hit, hit the grasses and twisted them. It was just that little bit to show a tiny bit of extra highlight hitting the grasses. And it made an, a wonderful difference to it. So allow yourself tip number six i think it is uh, is to allow yourself to go back and spend a little bit of time to add a finished detail but do not overwork it there's too many of it, too many of us have ruined paintings that we loved at one point because we overdid it okay so now it could this be good for you um i, I really if if there's an artist within you if you want to be an artist if you've ever wished to, to see if you could be an artist i believe you can be um, but here are some quotes from students who have painted with me. This first one, Michelle. Michelle had never painted before. And we were at a party. My wife and I were at a party and we were talking and, and, and Michelle said, yeah, I would love to be to try art, but I, I am a stick figure person. I can't do anything. 
And I said, if you really think you have the love for it, come and paint with me for a day, and I promise you, you will, you will see that there is an artist within. And this was her quote, quote, I created a painting I was so proud of framing and displaying in my own home. I received so many compliments from family and friends. And Michelle has gone on to paint more paintings since then. There is an artist within you. If, if you believe there is, there truly is. Um, this next painting, uh, Suzanne from, um, she said, makes a point, uh, Dick makes a point to say, always have fun. I don't worry about making mistakes. As a matter of fact, I have done numerous art demonstrations where I do a painting in front of uh, art groups, um, oftentimes 40 or 50 people or whatever. And I do a painting in an hour and a half or so, and I'm talking the whole time. And sometimes I'll start, I'll, I will always prep my surface ahead of time, but I'll start just by reaching into my box of pastel and picking out, I, I don't care what color it is. And I was painting something from Giverny one time and I picked out and I got this bright reddish magenta and I just whipped it across the surface of my uh, the painting that I was going to do. And I, everybody in the crowd went, what are you doing? And I said, we're going to make that red fit within the painting that we um, that I'm going to do. And I believe that you can actually use your mistakes or things like this, or you do something on purpose, use your mistakes to enhance the painting. So I don't worry about mistakes. Uh, Andy at the bottom here, Dick's approach is exactly the boost I needed to continue. And I find myself enjoying it even more. Here's a person who he just needed a little bit more boost. He was trying very hard to paint and he was coming up, but he wasn't improving. And I just pushed him. Go be more experimental with your colors. Be more exper experimental with the tools that you use. Um, have fun doing. Don't worry about mistakes. Don't plan quite so much as you're doing. And his, his painting has taken off. Now, it's one thing to have see words of what people have said about me and my style and stuff. Here are three different students. The student on the left um, came to me after. He had only painted a few paintings. But they were fairly flat, and he, he said, I, I don't know how I'm going to get depth. And so he brought this picture of a beautiful green field. Um, but as he started, look at this path to the right. As he started to paint that, he pulled out a couple of green pastels, and I said, no, 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 no. Put the greens away for now. Pull out five different blues, and I want to stretch those blues. And then pull out five different yellows, and use those ten colors to make that path. And he started laughing because the, the color and the, what he established here was so different than what he would have done. But by pushing himself, and then now he was having a blast and being free, so he chose all kinds of colors. And then I pushed him, I said, let's do different strokes. Don't always use the pastel stick or the brush in, with your oil in the same format. And don't always use it you know, like a crayon. Use the side, use the edge, use use all kinds of ways of putting that pastel and putting that pigment down. So this was one of the freest paintings I think he's ever done in his life, and um, I'm thrilled for him. The one on the on the right is uh, this gentleman has a, a family place, a cabin up in Maine, and he wanted to paint this large pond. Uh, pond, it's huge. Um, but what I loved about this, and it's not quite finished yet, but what I loved about it is look at the depth that he's got. You know, we go over those planes. Look in the right-hand panel how far back that plane number one is. It's way back there. And then plane number two is whatever that is, a, min a peninsula or a, an island in the middle. And then plane number three is over here on the left. And then plane number four is the water coming towards us. Then you get close, you get the boulders. And he's really getting tremendous depth. And he's got his own color scheme. And then the painting on the bottom, this uh, guy came to me with a, a very difficult photo that he had taken, a Lalique vase with a different type of glass uh, plate with some peaches in it, two different types of plant on a wooden surface. But when we pushed him to use, don't paint, you know, glass, do I need to paint with whites and grays? No, use lavenders, use all kinds of colors. If you look at his color scheme, he's got his own palette moving now. And all th what I love about all three of these is that they don't look like me and they don't look like each other. So these are students who I'm helping to push their own style, their own color palette, and their own love of, the, of painting. Okay, I'll go through a couple more quotes, um, testimonials. 
My first painting with Dick ended up being a beautiful oil painting that is vibrant, full of color, depth, and interest. Um, that's what I'm trying to get you to do, is to bring out the emotional appeal that you have inside you for the paintings that you want to do. This other lady, uh, Dick guided my artist's eye without altering my personal style. For example, when I reached for typical colors I saw around me, he challenged me to mix more colors. When you when we get to the um, the footbridge and you, you start painting the grasses in the front, I'm not going to let you start with any greens. Yes, marsh grass is green. I'm going to make you use magentas and browns and oranges and 10 different colors before we even get to a green but it'll make it look so much more it'll have so much more depth and it'll look so much more unique to you and when i push you to use a magenta or a brown and you'll look in your box and you'll pick out a color that is foreign to you but something that appeals to your eye that's when you're starting to develop your own palette so each of my artists that, that are painting with me are developing their own palette their own style they're not painting like me they're learning from me, but they're painting what's best for them. Okay, so next is in our presentation is, where are we? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, what are we getting for this? Okay, the deliverables are you will have a 90-minute one-on-one video painting lesson. It'll be as if you were painting, just like I painted with Herman. Well, I painted in his studio and he came and looked at it. Um, but you will paint with me in your studio while I'm painting in my studio. And we'll do the same footbridge painting. But we'll go through every every step of the way. We'll go f talk about the, the underpainting, the prepping for the surface, and how you use different colors and different strokes, etc. You'll also get a downloadable <clears throat> six-module printout of everything that I'm kind of throwing at you right now, but it'll be in much more in depth in the 90 minute video, but I'll give it to you in, in a printout so that you can read it and understand it. And the, what I would suggest you do is if you take this video painting lesson is you watch the 90 minute video through one time and then you, you can play it back obviously as many times as you want, it's yours forever, um, but then paint along with me down the road. I also think you're gonna have a blast. I have a blast every time I'm in the studio. I have a blast every time I'm with a student. I, I love it when I push someone and I see that smile when they try something that they're uh, afraid of and then they see the result and they go, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, I will help you to start seeing with an artist mind and mindset. I'll start to get you to understand what is an emotional appeal of something for you. Um, you will learn to experiment with color and I'll push you to use, uh, if, we, if we get to oils with you, I'll push you to use I use sponges, I use sticks, I use everything. I, yes, I use paintbrushes and palette knives, but I use all kinds of things. And you will prove to yourself that there really is an artist within you. You will paint your own version of the, of the footbridge. It doesn't have to look like mine, but you will, be, you will finish a painting that you will be very, very proud of. Um, and so if you, if you choose to do this within the next 24 hours or so, if, um, we're going to give you 20% off. So there is a code to, to do it less expensive than normal. Um, okay, so let me go, go through these seven painting tips. If You can take a screenshot, certainly, or you can email me. I'll give you my contact information in just a, a second. Um, and anyone, you can email me with any question you have whatsoever, and I will get back to you. It might take me a, a day or two, but I will get back. But there are seven painting tips that I walked you through. There's no one right color. You will always prep your surface. I'm going to teach you to see with an artist's eye and mindset. Take time to learn and edit your own reference photos. Learn to paint from back to front and, and uh, from underneath to, to the top. Include emotional appeal. So tell yourself, understand for yourself what is an emotional appeal for you for whatever painting that you're trying to do, and then allow yourself some time later on to go back and add a, just a touch more detail. Um, and Okay, so the, how do we get our pricing? Uh, very straightforward. Uh, uh, almost 40 years ago, I was painting with my mentor, Herman, and I would pay, I paid him $250 a day. Um, and what I got from is I learned artist eye and mindset. I learned how to prep the surface. I learned to have emotional appeal. So I'm going to 
communicate a lot of that same kind of information to you almost 40 years later. And the, the expense for each of our, or the charge for each of our, this is the first, I'm going to have more video training lessons in the future. Um, but it's $250, the same price I paid him so many years ago. And if you would um, choose to go very quickly, then you'll get 20% off this week and you get, uh, so it's $200. But whether you join me or not, um, I, I absolutely appreciate you you, um, you joining me and coming to this. Um, here's my email. My email is dickmacaboy24 at gmail.com. Um, you can email me questions about the, the video if you'd like, if you'd like to learn more about what it, what it has, but you can ask me any question whatsoever about art and I will get back to you. Um, I greatly appreciate you joining me on this first webinar. Um, I hope you'll join me in our video painting lesson and I hope you'll find the artist within you. I'm not trying to get you to paint necessarily like me. I'm trying to bring out the best painting, the best artist that I know is within you right now. So again, thank you so much for joining me and um, thanks for coming to my webinar.